The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. Uh, I think probably the first thing I should do is talk to you a little bit about ratio and proportion before I start this uh, sequence. Um, in the Greek, the word for ratio is logos. And you all know John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the logos. This is the logos. Plato in the Timaeus says that there is a bond of nature that ties everything together. And I know that some of this is going to sound a bit esoteric. You just have to bear with me because I've got a lot I'm going to try to cram in in the time that I've got. But it's basically the geometric mean. Proportion is analogos, where you have a repeating ratio. So let me give you an example. Usually, usually I use pens, but I think I can uh, use fingers today. Let's say that I hold up four fingers and two here. So the ratio, which is relationship between two magnitudes, two numbers, two lengths, whatever, this would be, you read left to right, would be what? Four, four is to two. Four is to two. Or it could even be the fraction, four divided by two. So four is to two. Um, I hold up 10 fingers. 10 is to five. Are those the same ratios? Four is to two is as 10 is to five. Absolutely. Now, I do the same thing, but I put up four, two, four is to two, is as two is to one. Notice that there's a bond between those two ratios. Again, we have proportion, four is to two equals two is to one. They're both double. But the two acts as the geometric mean that bonds things together. So those of you who study Plato and you know about his lambda, one, two, four, eight, one, three, nine, twenty-seven. Each of those have geometric means linking them together. This is the soul. The soul has a foot in the intelligible realm and a foot in the sensible realm down here, and it bonds things together. This is the key to the secret of the hermetic maxim. As above, so below, and as below, so above. The trouble is you have a duality there. You need to bond it. And that's how you do it, is through this continuous geometric proportion is the title. Now, if I take a yardstick, and I'm going to have to kind of fudge here a little bit for you here again. So here I have a yardstick. <clears throat> Can I cut this yardstick with a simple single cut so that I get this geometric proportion with one simple cut. This is how the divine works. This is how the universe began. Now, <clears throat> you might say, well, why not just cut it in half, two 18-inch segments? So yardstick in this hand, this piece over here, what would be the ratio of the two pieces? Two is to one. But then when I take the two pieces, I would have is that proportion? Because they're not equal ratios. There's one and only one place you can take a line immediately, economically, efficiently, and get proportion. The whole universe from top to bottom has been fractalized by the golden section. We see it in the quarks. We see it in the structures of animals, plants. You'll see it. And I'm going to blow you away today. I'm going to tell you right now. We're going for a ride. Um, now, where do you cut it? You cut it so that you have these two segments so that if I take this one here, it's going to be 22 and a quarter inches. But I want you to remember the number 22.25. That's 22 and a quarter, 22.25. The smaller piece is going to be 13 and three quarters inches. This, these are in golden ratio now which is 13.75. And you'll see in a little bit why I'm stressing this. 
Now, yes, you could cut it here, or we could flip it, and you could cut it here. That's true, but it still is in the same relationship. That's the golden cut. The ancient Egyptians called that the primordial scission. And you can continue to fractalize. Let's say that I took the 13.75 inches and golden cut it. So now we have, this might be a good one to show you. I now have three pieces. Here's how this works, relatively speaking. If this middle one is the bond, unity or one, this is the greater, 1.618. This is the lesser, 0 0.618. I'm, I'm kind of abbreviating it. The greater times the lesser equals this. The greater minus the lesser equals the same like, same magnitude, okay? Now, <clears throat> I have to do this quick, so that's, this is a golden calipers. This ratio from here relative to here, golden ratio, no matter how wide or how narrow. Sometimes you'll see three prongs, all in golden ratio. That's what the ancients did, that's what they did during the Renaissance. Michelangelo would take a block of marble, and because the navel cuts us in the golden cut, they would take that three prongs and they would cut it so that you would get the navel and they would then go through the whole process. That's why the sculptures in ancient Greece looked like, as Plato said, Daedalus's statues look like they're gonna walk right off the, the dais because they are mimicking, not copying nature, but they're, they're mimicking or copying the ratios and proportions that are significant in nature. That's the secret of art and of good art and of beauty. Now in uh, New York, those who study faces and are looking for the most beautiful faces, they have a mask. And they use that mask, and now all of us have golden ratios throughout the body. But there's a certain way they've found where beauty stands out, and they use that. Uh, Mark Hort uses, uh, designed the mask, and that's the, one of the things they do. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this. I'll use my finger. It's the bones. It's not the flesh. So if I take the narrow part, this is an old timer, so I've got to do this very carefully, and you're looking at the flanges. These phalanges, the three of them in the finger, are in golden ratio to each other. So let's start at the narrow. It's, boy, this is dull, but we'll try it. I flip it over. I didn't jostle it. And you go to the next phalange. I want to make sure everybody sees that. That's golden ratio. I flip it over, do the same thing with the narrow. Flip it over again, and I now go to here which is the sum of the previous two, okay? In fact, your finger, if you think about it, the longer piece is the greater, the little baby bear there, that's the lesser, and that's unity in between that ties them together. It's the greater and the lesser. What's greater? It's greater than one. What's lesser? It's less than one. And all of nature works with this pulsation um, in terms of the dynamics of how it develops. Now, some things are more, some things less. Nature likes to use whole numbers, and we have what are called the Fibonacci numbers. They begin with zero and one. Any child can do the additive series. Each new number is the sum of the previous two. So zero plus one is one, one plus one, two, one plus two, three. So it goes zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, DNA molecule. If you take a full strand, 34 angstroms in length, 21 angstroms in width. It's everywhere. When people say, well, where is the golden section? I say, where is it not? Now, it's not the only logos. Plato in the Timaeus, as we're going to see, revealed two triangles that embody logoi, root two and root three. 
But he didn't reveal, it's conspicuous by its absence, that he did not tell us how to build the dodecahedron. He told us how to build earth, air, fire, and water with those four solids, and I'll show you. But he left blank how to do the dodecahedron. Why? Because to do the dodecahedron, the faces are all pentagons. Anytime you have a pentagon and you draw a pentagram in there, every place where the lines intersect, they're all in golden relationship, golden ratio. That gives away the secret. This was one of the mysteries that I know for a fact was revealed. Blavatsky says it. In the initiations, the revelation was that you were given the ratios and proportions of nature. And that's what I'm going to reveal today. In essence, I want to show you what has been previously esoteric. We need to make it exoteric. And you're going to ask me why. Look at the world right now. Yeah, there have been bad times in the world before. Well, we are on the verge of absolute, utter collapse. I'm of the opinion that if we get the truth out there about these things, then we have the possibility of transformation. OK, the golden section, nature's greatest secret. I want to dedicate this to Narashima, the fourth principle incarnation of Vishnu who, it is my belief, is the custodian of any shamanic transformation in consciousness, mystical experience. I take us all to be like the plant kingdom, like the flowers, like this dahlia, but we haven't blossomed yet. The arhats, the adepts, the buddhas, the Christs, the mahatmas, they have blossomed. They come into full bloom or relative levels of it. It doesn't mean it stops at a certain point. It probably continues on and on. We do not know. However, I do think that one can go into a state of samadhi in which one downloads the consciousness of the entire universe, that that is our potential. Because as you will see in this presentation, the universe is loaded into each of its parts. That's what it means to be a hologram. So we're all on a path. We're on a quest. The key for each of us is to figure out our purpose. And that can be difficult, but it's very, very important. We don't want to end our life and then, oh no, we didn't do it again, and then realize it. Sometimes it's an upward ascent, a kind of Promethean ascent, a Capricornian ascent up the mountain of initiation, uh, as we see in this painting by Alex Gray that the caduceus held by the potential initiate. Perhaps more often than not, as Joseph Campbell would say on the hero's journey, it's a downward descent where we have to face our, our lower self, our dweller on the threshold, overcome it, and then discover the philosopher's stone, discover the pearl of great price. Or as in this case, we see Jason returning with the golden fleece with Athena standing over him as he emerges from the dragon. All of us are on a path to achieve ultimately, certainly, bodhisattvahood, Buddhahood. All of us, every single person in here. Some are going to make it sooner than others, but all of us have that potential. And that's, to me, that's what it is to be a theosophist. And this again by Alex Gray, and he calls this bodhisattva. Now, some of us have been fortunate um, to have um, Perinatal experiences, uh, awareness at birth. Um, this is, and we're, I definitely believe we're born into families for a reason and for a purpose. Anything I really have delivered to deliver to you has to do with my family and my teachers. This is yours truly. Um, my sister Kathy in the middle, my brother Ted, Nancy hadn't arrived yet. And uh, I did have a perinatal experience. I was aware at birth. I wish I was a hundredth as aware now as I was at the time of birth. Okay? And I, well, one of the problems with this presentation is I can't go into details. I can't explain everything because we're going to need to move forward. Now, my brother, I must tell you, was Hercules incarnate. He was the strongest, I'm serious, with his arms are the strongest of any man in the world. At 18, he held the world's record in the curl. K2 
came home from high school, saw what the record was, went in the garage, put his back against the uh, door, and he curled the, uh, in excess of the world's record. He was incredible. But what I'd like you to do now, Plato said, we don't just take light in through the eyes. We exude it. If you want to see will and intention and the power of choice, you look at the eyes of the individual, and you will see it. He was a bodybuilder. He had a great influence on me. He was a Capricorn. My father is a Capricorn. And Douglas Baker had a big influence on me. I met him very early on. And when I was a student at the University of London at Birkbeck studying with David Bohm, I did research for Baker. Here we're in Cape Town, South Africa, at one of his international conferences. Plato has been my path. Now, why? Baker primarily was the one who introduced me. I cut my teeth on the ancient wisdom with him. Blavatsky turned me on to Plato. I came through an esoteric door first, whereas most people who become esoteric tend to go through the exoteric, get disappointed, and then move towards the esoteric. But because of that awareness early on, I went directly into Plato's geometry and his inner hidden material. So you see back in 75, I was writing on Plato's occult doctrine, his epistemology, how we come to know, his ontology or metaphysics, what is out there, what exists, what is real. This is, of course, Asclepius, god of medicine, son of Apollo. And so we are all seeking truth, beauty, and goodness as we come up out of the cave into the light and ultimately into illumination. Philolaus the Pythagorean stated that in all things that can, can be known, contain number. Without this, nothing can be thought or known in fragment four. This is Blavatsky now. Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Plato is, not one of, Plato is the world's interpreter. And the ideas of Pytha both Pythagoras and Plato were identical with ours. In my dissertation, first thing I did was to show that Plato was primarily a Pythagorean and that he had discovered or used a method of reasoning called retroduction or abduction. Can't talk about it now. Uh, it's not deduction, it's not induction. That's what they did in the academy. He presented the anomalies or puzzles or problems, and the members of the academy would abduct the new hypothesis to explain. Uh, he did the same thing in the dialogues. Most scholars don't realize that. Title of my dissertation, just so you know, The Pythagorean Plato and the Golden Section, A Study in Abductive Inference. Now, Plato was bound by the Sedalian Oath. If you want to see this, look in Isis Unveiled, look in the introduction of Book 5 of The Secret Doctrine, here in the Key to Theosophy, page 96. But keep in mind the penalty of revealing the mystery doctrines, which was death. And though we do give out to the world as much as is lawful, even in our doctrines, more than one important detail is withheld, which those who study the esoteric philosophy, bless you, and are pledged to silence are alone entitled to know. In the Mahatma letters, it is made very clear that Plato is not only coming, in a sense, from the future, in a future sub-race or even root race, he's a fifth rounder. Buddha is said to be a sixth rounder. But Plato, a fifth rounder, is as if they're coming in from the future to help instruct us and to uh, help us unfold. So uh, I was completely taken by uh, Plato and the whole notion of mind, body, sound mind, sound body, putting them together. And I did a uh, summa thesis on platonic aesthetics at the University of Minnesota. You see, the dates are the same. This is all 1975. I was influenced to get into bodybuilding. I became one of the three best bodybuilders as a teenager in, in the nation, which means really in the world. Um, and then later, now I didn't realize it. All of that was training for later downloading of consciousness experiences so that my body could handle it. Bodybuilding was actually my asanas and the breathing, the pranayama, and I prepared myself for the to endure some very, very powerful experiences. Later on, as you see, uh, up at uh, Cosm, Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, I did a workshop with Lance Harding, who is the expert in the world on canons of human proportion, and Alex Gray, the great artist, 
and Zachariah Gregory, who did some drawings for my book, um, golden section in the canon of human proportion. So in the beginning was the logos. And it's really the search for the sacred number. Uh, here from the School of Athens in the center, you have Plato pointing up as above, Aristotle hand downward. Timaeus in his hand, the cosmology, and Aristotle with his Nicomachean ethics, more the practical uh, of this world, as above, so below, and so forth. Um, one of my primary teachers has been Houston Smith on the left here. Uh, we're in his home. I spent a summer at Berkeley studying with him the esoteric dimension of religion. And uh, you want to wonder why we're all smiling. I just cracked them up because we're posing for a picture. And I told him, I feel like a caduceus. And I'm Shashumna, and you guys are Ida and Pingala. And I'll tell you, the fire is running up that spine right now. And they just. And I'm still working with Houston. He's going to do the preface for my next book. He's 90 years old. He's still active. And he's, a, he's the most saintly man I know on the earth. While I was with him, I wrote Plato and the Divine Proportion, Ascent to the First Principles in 94. Now, here's what I was showing you initially. You see, it doesn't matter which finger you're using. It's all relative. Now, here you've got that kind of golden calipers or compass I was telling you about in three sections there. Now, if you had the head of a person and their feet here, that would be the navel right there. And think about the significance of the navel. So all of these are in relative golden proportion. Doesn't matter what you start with. Let's just move on. You get the picture. Plato in the Republic, in the divided line next to the cave, says, take a line and cut it unevenly. Well, you already know why you cut it unevenly. If you cut it evenly, you can't get proportion. And you can cut it any different way unevenly, but there's only one way that you can cut it in the golden cut. We could flip it over. In fact, we'll do it in the next slide. And as I said, the ancient Egyptians called this the primordial scission. This is when the one, this is the secret of how the one becomes many. This is the greatest philosophical problem that in existence. How does the one become many, and how do each of the many return unto the one? You've got to figure out the bond in between. That's why there are trinities galore. That's why Vishnu stands in the middle between Brahma and Shiva. That's why the sun in the uh, Christian trinity, which they got help from the Neoplatonists, they helped them figure that whole thing out. Now, I just want to remind you, because this is where people fell down. They would look at this and they'd say, oh, this is the greater and this is the lesser. No, 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 no. Yes, this is the lesser, the reciprocal of the golden ratio. This would be the 0.618, this little piece here. But the greater is the totality, is the, this is the greater, big phi. This is the letter, lesser, little phi, we call it. And here's what bonds them together. It turns out to be exactly one, or unity. Now, here's how the whole thing works. So the whole is to the upper line here in the same ratio as it is to the lower, in the same ratio as the world of forms of Plato are to the world of the mathematicals, as the everyday objects of this lower world are to the artifacts that we create, if we're enlightened. This is the shadows on the wall. These are the everyday objects. But the shadows get transmuted into golden ratio when the initiate ascends up out of the cave into the light, becomes illuminated in a state of samadhi, and then returns into the cave and enlightens his or her friends. And then we start making artifacts and buildings and architecture, which resonates. And we go into altered states of consciousness just by being in the presence of the structures which mimic the divine proportion. This, I need to tell you, this is Plato's divided line. It was a simple solution. For over 2,000, maybe 300, 400 years, they, you know, others had speculated, but this is it. Now, you may notice, we'll see this again, but phi is to 1 as 1 is to phi. Notice that these, this is the geometric bond. These are equivalent. And here you have it. Um, this is taken from my book, 
on the golden section. So big phi, 1.618 is to 1, in the same ratio as 1 is to phi. Somehow, there's an overlap here. In other words, assume you're down here, and let's assume this is the lower world, and you're unawakened, and you move up into here, and you go into enlightenment because you get up into the, uh, outside the cave, into the light, in the illumination. On the way back down, you realize that the mathematicals here are infused into nature, which is our subject here, the gateway to the sacred um, aspects of nature. And so this is very important that these are identical. Um, the whole here then is golden section cubed is to the golden section squared in the same ratio as golden section squared is to the golden section to the first power in the same ratio as golden section is to one in the same ratio down here is one unity is to the lesser. According to Plato, the one in the indefinite dyad, indefinite two, which he spoke of as the great and the small, are the principles of all things and even of the forms themselves. Simplicius records Alexander's commentary and Aristotle's now lost books on the good. Plato's lecture that he wouldn't uh, what, put, commit to writing was delivered in an enigmatic style, but some of the students, including Spusippus, Xenocrates, and others, recorded his comments on the lecture on the good, but unfortunately, none of this still exists. Um, they were destroyed. And you want to look at Simplicius on Aristotle's Physics, 187a12. Look in Kramer, 1990, page 203. So in the Nexus Network Journal of Architecture and Mathematics, I wrote the paper, The Indefinite Diet in the Golden Section, Uncovering Plato's Second Principle. Just Google my name, put in Golden Section or Indefinite Diet, you can get this. This is my best work. Um, I'm now kind of infamous for my book, but this is the best thing I've ever done. So the five platonic solids are really down here. The tetrahedron is your fire. The octahedron, eight sides. Notice these are all equilateral triangles is air. Icosahedron, 20 sides, all equilateral triangles is your water. The cube is earth. So there's your earth, air, fire, and water. But here's the cosmos. And this is the dodecahedron. And look at what you've got on the 12 faces. Each is a, um, a pentagon. These are the 13 Archimedean solids. What can you tell me about the numbers 5 and 13? They are they're Fibonacci numbers. In fact, 13 is to 5. 8 is to 5 is approximate golden ratio. 13 is a 5 is the golden section squared. You go up the next octave. And really what's happening, by the way, is all of nature, everything is being influenced by a pulse. Golden ratio times the former number gives you the next. Golden ratio times the, this next number gives you the next one in order. Now, in the Timaeus, Plato revealed two triangles, Roman numeral two, just for the sake of uh, identifying this now, where you take a square, you bisect it along its diagonal, and you get the root two. Um, so you have the root two triangle, and the root two gets you your cube, your earth, the root three is the faces. You have equilateral triangle bisected, so you get your root three. Um, all three li um, lines are unequal. In the previous one, two of the lines are equal because you got one, one. The picture's a little bit distorted. But some of you know the Timaeus, perhaps you don't. The beginning of the Timaeus, nobody has cracked. One, two, three, but where is the fourth, my dear Timaeus? But he also gives this incredible hint that the scholars miss. He's always telling you to look more deeply. These then we assume to be the original elements of fire and other bodies, root two and root three triangles. But the principles which are prior to these, deity only knows, and he of men who is a friend of deity. Anyone who can point out a more beautiful form than ours for the construction of these bodies shall carry off the palm, not as an enemy, but as a friend. Hint, hint, hint. He who disproves what we are saying and shows that we are mistaken may claim a friendly victory. Timaeus 53a to 54b. 
In studying Speusippus, Plato's nephew who took over the academy when Plato passed on, we find that in his notes or his writings, fragments on, on Pythagorean numbers, we find that there was a kind of hidden one recognized by students of the academy, which is your equilateral triangle, but it's representative of one because all the sides are unity. So the equilateral triangle is one. But there's a fourth one that he could not reveal because it would help you construct a pentagon which would give you a pentagram, which would give you golden section. So here's the secret. One, two, three, but where is the fourth? Again, he's hinting to the reader. Look more deeply, abduct the hypothesis to explain it. Okay, now it's interesting when you nest the platonic solids. Here in icosahedron, water is nested inside the cube, earth. And notice on the face of the cube, the um, edge of the icosahedron hits up against it, and you find that if that is unity or one, you find that the length of the line right here, the edge of the cube, is in phi ratio to it. In fact, the, the Euclid's Elements are a series of books that ultimately in the 13th book, from point line planes, you build solids, and then you get your phi platonic solids, and it's all about these internal ratios. So if you put the icosahedron, in this case, inside a octahedron, air, notice what happens. A little different now. Here the vertex, some people call it the vertice, the vertex, the point hits the line, the edge of the octahedron, and cuts the line in phi is to one, in golden relationship. And it happens in all of them in different ways. Now here's the icosahedron. If the edge here is one, you run across to the opposite side. That's exactly, no approximations here, phi. They're in phi to one relationship. And furthermore, that's a golden rectangle that runs through it. So we come back to the School of Athens, um, painted by Raphael. Uh, if you've ever been to the Vatican, you must go to the Raphael room. Huge canvas, beautiful on the wall. Um, and of course, Plato and Aristotle in the center. Here we've got Euclid. When I go to Alexandria with the New York Open uh, Group in 2011, we're going back to Alexandria. And we're, I'm going to talk about Euclid. And here she is. Does anybody know who that is? It's Hypatia. Most people do not look at the floor. They're so busy looking at the canvas. But look, root two, root three, root three here. Anytime you've got a hexagram, which is surrounded by a hexagon, which is the closest packing of space, that's why the numbers, one of the reasons seven is so central, not only in the secret doctrine, but in all septenary nature of the universe, is of this close packing. Um, the six days of creation around the seventh day of rest in the center and so forth. But one has to open their eyes and look. Same room, on the wall, painting. Painting of a cabinet. Now look what's in that cabinet. Icosahedron, dodecahedron. Golden ratios, as I showed you, if that's one, you run across the other side. These are all pentagons. By the way, if you take the center point of the um, dodecahedron, one of the faces, go to the center point of another face, we'll go to that one, connect them up, go across the other side, you again get a golden rectangle. Um, the icosahedron and the dodecahedron are duels of each other. Now, when I was at Buckfist Abbey with Keith Critchlow, who's the greatest uh, teacher of uh, sacred geometry in the world, um, now retired from the Prince of Wales uh, Institute, which used to be Institute of Architecture, he's head of Vita, Visual and Islamic Arts, uh, Visual Islamic and Traditional Arts, student of Buckminster Fuller, uh, tremendous mind, but I had a waking dream. And in the waking dream, I realized, wait a minute, and nobody talks about this. Uh, notice here you got two golden rectangles back to back. Here's big phi, here's little phi, and here's unity. But I realized, wait a minute, if you make the leg of a right angle triangle phi, 
and you make the other leg phi, you get exactly root 3, not an approximation. So out of the womb of the golden ratio come the other logoi. I later discovered from a friend of mine how root 2 comes out of the square root of the golden section and little baby phi, it's uh, the reciprocal of the golden ratio, but I'll show you that in a second. I jumped out of bed, grabbed it. This is the original drawing right here. I've embellished it by putting the hard lines in and coloring it, but that's it. Now here's another original drawing. Here's how you do it. Now, <clears throat> it was somewhat secretive how to even do a golden rectangle. I'm not claiming that secretive now, uh, but here's how you do it. You construct a square. You bisect it vertically like this. You then draw a diagonal in the half square, which means that portion over on the right is really a double square, if you think about it. That means that this is really a root 5 divided by 2 in this case, but just think of root 5 because that angle right there is absolutely significant. If we have time and we, we get to the um, pyramids, I'll show you how this works and how that's encoded all over um, the Giza Plateau and in the pyramid. So you then uh, take your compass point here, pencil lead here. You see the arc in the original drawing, but I didn't have that move. You come down here. And so now you extend it, and you the overall thing is a golden rectangle. The yellow is another smaller golden rectangle. I kind of jumped the gun here. Pencil uh, point here, lead here, arc down. For those of you who want to know the geometry, you cut this line here in what's called the square root of the golden section. <clears throat> Very significant. I then drop that line down here, square root of the golden mean. I drop the golden mean itself, big phi down here. You then cap it off there, which turned this in gematria. The Greeks were incredible because what they did in the names of the gods is they encoded the geometry. And Quest has published a book by um, David Feidler, Jesus Christ, Son of God, S-U-N, incredible, um, in which some of this gematria is exposed, not necessarily all of this. Um, and so this is the god Hermes. Then go a step further. You connect up that diagonal. That's exactly root 3. That's exactly root 2. And this is how nature builds its squares and therefore cubes, therefore earth, that platonic solid. And here you get your equilateral triangle. You see the diamond. I want to point something out. Um, you take two circles. You overlap them. You keep the radius the same. This is the vesica Pisces. There's that little triangle right there. However, if you go across and you call that one, then this whole green line is root 3. And that is related to Zeus, but we need to move on. So here's the golden chalice of Orion, big phi, little phi, root, square root of the golden mean. And those are your root 3 and root 2. And then on the top is your 1 half root 2. And these are all identified with the Greek gods. So in the Statesman, Plato says, it is in this way, when they preserve the standard of the mean, that all their works are good. The greater and the lesser to be measured in relation to one another. What happens when you take phi and phi, greater and lesser, and relate them, it's phi squared. But then he goes on, <clears throat> but also to the establishment of the mean, where one is in the center. So phi to one, it's phi, golden ratio. One to phi, the lesser, golden ratio. Go the other direction, phi is to one. Now some of this, I realize this is kind of new language. Lesser is to 1, it's little baby phi, 0.618. 1 divided by big phi, again, little baby phi, uh, 0.618. Um, now, let's drop to the bottom here. He's dividing it into two parts. This last one is what we want to really look at. The other comprises those which measure them in relationship to the moderate, the fitting, the opportune, the needful and all the other standards that are situated in the mean between the extremes. Statesman 284A1 through E8. Now here's another person who I've befriended, and he's the one twice nominated for the Nobel Prize. Um, one day, this is the, the real candidate. He's the best physicist in the world. 
He has taken the golden section. He's solving all the most intractable problems. His name is Muhammad El Nashi. And I went to his house uh, not too long ago in England. One whole shelf is, is composed of my golden section book. He gives it to every scientist, every physicist, every mathematician he comes in contact with. You know why he's better than anybody else? He knows mathematics better than any of them. Dirac said, look to the equations that are beautiful. I go into altered states of consciousness when I look at his equations. It is the most beautiful things that you have ever seen. It is absolutely stunning. And this is where it starts out. And if you look at the date up there, I think you got 1994 is quantum space, a random Cantor set with a golden mean dimension at the core. If you look closely on January 7th of this year, it was revealed from Bristol University, Oxford University, and the Rutherford Laboratories, three in England, one in Germany, collaborating. Uh, they discovered, using Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, that the golden ratio is the principle of symmetry. Now remember, it's not a symmetric cut. You're not cutting in the middle. It's not bilateral. It's asymmetric that leads to what we call proportional symmetry. That is the principle they discovered at the root of quantum mechanics. Here's what he wrote me. Uh, I've got to translate for you. Uh, your book, The Golden Section, is a delightful uh, little book. It is marvelous. I will be referring to it always. Maybe you should write something, a, sometime a longer book. My very best wishes, Muhammad. Muhammad says, it is well, a well-known fact that the golden mean is the limit of the most important mathematical, when he uses the word gross, general law, which nature employs in countless processes, namely the Fibonacci general or gross law. We see it in the works of Annie Besant and C.W. Leadbeater, and you're going to discover it in the Anu, in the ultimate physical atom. What really is turning out to be is Stephen Phillips writes, a theosophist, brilliant mathematician. His knowledge about string theory is incredible, and he calls it a subquark. I visited him in his home in Bournemouth. Uh, initiation into the mysteries. Pythagoras was an initiate. That should be a quotation mark. I'm sorry, up in the corner there. It's taken from the intergroup teachings of Blavatsky. One of the grandest scientists. Plato and Euclid were initiates. Euclid learned his geometry where? in the mysteries. Modern men of science only rediscover the truths. Blavatsky, I'm paraphrasing, Plato's initiatory knowledge of the ratios and proportional symmetry attained in the mysteries was preserved by Vitruvius, quote, who gave to posterity the rules of construction of the Grecian temples to the immortal gods, who was himself an initiate and can only be studied esoterically, Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, page 209. Most significantly, now this is a biggie, it is the proportional symmetry, which I call the golden proportional symmetry, that was revealed in the ancient initiations, passed down by the adepts of the fourth root race, and it is within this initiatory tradition of the mysteries that all the rules of proportion, these are her italics now, not mine, that are taught anciently at initiations, and one should acquaint himself with the truly divine art and understand the deep significance hidden in every rule and law of proportion, volume one, page 208. Blavatsky was also very interested in the Amblichus, the Neoplatonic theurgist, who had three levels of theurgy in terms of what she called synthemata. The highest, it would, by the way, it would induce healing and transformation of consciousness. And the highest level, first you'd have plants, stones, objects of the outer world, then you'd go to sounds, chants, music, and then you'd go to the ratios and proportions. That was the subtlest, most sublime for taking one into the higher states of consciousness. Blavatsky says the geometrical key is one of the seven keys hitherto unknown to the initiates. She reminds us we find it in the various temples. You find it all over the place. Ark of the Covenant is an obvious one. Two and one half cubits by one and a half cubits. Forget about how long a cubit is. Two and one half to one and a half. Think about it for a second. How many times does one half go into two and a half? Five times. 
How many times does one half go into one and a half? Three times. Five is to three. Golden ratio approximation. They're Fibonacci numbers. Temples, whether it's Hindu, Buddhist, a mosque, synagogue. Here's the Telesterion at Eleusis. It's shameful that this was destroyed. <clears throat> this is my favorite temple site. I spend, when I go to Athens, I spend a lot of time here studying it. 3,000 to up to 4,000 people were initiated simultaneously in the Telesterion. And they kept it secret. It was so incredible. And the blind would see during the experience, just like near-death experiences. When they go into illumination experiences, some of them bring back the equations of physics and the blind see. In studying the grounds around there, you learn a little bit about the spirals and the sacred plants that they were using in their kaikion. And notice here, let's go a little closer and you see what's going on. And there's your hexagonal, there's your six-pointed star. This is all from Eleusis. It's all alchemical. It's all transformative. And if we go to Kunrath's uh, amphitheater of e eternal wisdom, uh, first notice the musical instruments. It's all vibration, it's resonance, it's attunement, it's going into attunement, uh, entrainment. That's the key. It's synchrony. You synchronize with a higher being or higher state of consciousness, you drop your lower self, and you re-identify with the higher self. Now take a look. Let's zoom in in this temple. Look what's on the altar. I don't have to say another word. We also find it in Selvam's chaotic climate uh, dynamics. It's all fractal. That's why um, El Nashi is the physicist of all physicists, because Nonlinear dynamics is at work, and he is the mathematician of all mathematicians. And guess what? Hurricanes, tornadoes, they all have the same winding number as nature's phylo, taxis, leaf arrangement. These are living beings, by the way. Shadows of the Mind, a search for the missing science of consciousness, Roger Penrose. He and Stuart Hameroff are focusing on what they call microtubules. But guess what? Microtubules are made up of 13 tubulins, eight spiraling one way, Five spiral in the other. 13 is to 8, is 8 is to 5. These are all golden ratios. We are all set up ahead of time. We are pre programmed structurally now to go into resonance. This is where the quantum computer is coming from. This is what allows us to resonate, or like a Buddha sitting under, or Siddhartha sitting under the bow tree, going into an illumination state or what Plato called anamnesis, remembrance. You remember all your past lives. You open up the third eye. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Penrose, the brilliant Penrose, says, why do Fibonacci numbers arise in microtubule structure? And guess what? A double microtubule, instead of 13 plus 13, 26 tubulin, guess, guess what the next number is in a double microtubule? Fibonacci number, 21. Next one. 8 plus 13, 21. And at the tips of the microtubules are clathrins. And what are the clathrins? They're Buckminster fullerenes. They're soccer balls. They are truncated icosahedra. In other words, you take an icosahedra and you chop off the corners and you get your buckyball. And guess where these things are? Here's your microtubules. Here's your clathrins. Here's the synaptic juncture. So when you're going into higher states of consciousness, these are going into resonance. And here's what happens with the shaman, shamanic experiences. They all report their serpents, the jewel in the mouth or near the mouth. I'm convinced that this is both DNA they're seeing and microtubules, clathrins. Edgar Mitchell went into a state of what he called samadhi on the way back from the moon. Uh, from, on Apollo 14, wrote The Way of the Explorer and Apollo Astronaut's Journey Through the Material and Mystical Worlds. Now notice what he writes in a paper called Nature's Mind, again relevant for our theme here, the quantum hologram. What I really want you to look at is, well, a lot of people said, no, you, the, the brain can't handle quantum uh, events and quantum consciousness. Well, Hameroff, he cites, and Penrose in isolating, describing microtubules and brain tissue. 
have caused a re-examination and renewed interest in uncovering the quantum processes involved. Now, Mitchell, I must tell you, is a good friend. We did together Consciousness 2005 and Beyond. His was Frontiers of Consciousness Studies. My interest is the self, self-identity that dies, anatta, and you discover ultimately Ataman. Buddhism, anatta, no self, yes. You get rid of all false notions, but then you discover Brahman, and Brahman, Atman is Brahman. And ultimately, it's resonant consciousness, resonance, and self-identity. Blavatsky, atoms are called vibrations and occultism. It's all vibrations, it's resonance. This is an early picture. In fact, this is some of the earliest photographs, slides, of the bottom of a tin can resonating at different frequencies. These are holograms. You see what happens when you change the frequency. Sound is being converted into shape. That's why when the third eye is actually open, people go into synesthesia, and they begin to see sound. You see what you're, you see the logos. Now here, a page from my book, this was painted by the famous shaman, uh, Pablo Amaringo, who's unfortunately passed. Here are your microtubules, here are your DNA. If you take a sagittal section, slice through the DNA, look what you get. It's a decagon. Well, what's a decagon? It's two pentagons superimposed on each other. So you've got, this is all golden ratio. If you think about the thousand petal lotus, you've got a hundred decagons, you've got two hundred pentagons. That puts us in resonance with the divine. Scientific American, are you a hologram? Guess what? Quantum physics says the entire universe might be. We see it in music. I'm going to go a little faster now. In various places, Fib and Fine Music, Charles Mad. We see it in these golden rectangles, or, or triangles, not just rectangles. You see it throughout the fossils, if you ever study the fossils of nature. Beautiful mountain sheep horns. We've got it encoded in some of our theosophists' writings and thinking and presentations. Yellow Brick Road is really the golden brick road. Jacob's Ladder by William Blake. It spirals. Uh, my father, we had a, a farm with uh, trees that we planted. He cut down one of these pine trees, cut, or first cut the branches off, later cut it down, but cut through where the branches have been. You find this pentagonal thumbprint of the divine everywhere in nature, chambered nautilus, mnemonic growth. You see it in, in the various plant life, pine cones, pineapples. Pineapples are great because you get three Fibonacci numbers, 5, 8, 13. Look here at the pine cone. If you want to discover these things, pick up a pine cone, look underneath, actually start to draw from the center, and you'll find that you've got eight spirals going that direction, 13 going the other direction, Here's how it works with the Fibonacci numbers. Any two adjacent Fibonacci's, you create a ratio. For example, here we got five divided by three. It actually happens pretty quick. Should be a point there. You get 1.5, three divided by two, five divided by three, like a uh, Ark of the Covenant, 1.666. It's above, it's too much, but you get closer and closer. Eight divided by five is 1.6. In the limit, here's the golden ratio. Uh, golden section. And notice it's asymptotically moving up and, and down uh, to it in the limit. If, on the other hand, you took the smaller number and divided by the larger adjacent number, you'd drop the one here and you'd be moving towards the lesser little baby fee. My editor, John Martineau, wrote his own book, Little Book of Coincidence. When we look at Venus from the Earth over an eight-year period, the Maya knew this, what happens is it describes this rosette of a pentagram. Eight years, five-pointed star, takes 13 years on Venus for it to happen according to Venus's time. If you take the orbits of the planets, you average them out instead of taking them as their ellipses, slightly flatten them, he pumped it into a computer, root two, root three, golden mean is tying together all of the orbits of the planets. Biomathematics penetrating nature's uh, mysteries of geometric design. Is there a primordial design? 
Is there really order behind all the infinite diversity or seeming infinite diversity we find outside? I keep telling my wife, I want this for my reading room. This is from a castle in uh, old Bohemia when we were doing studying alchemy and Rosicrucianism over there. He got into this one. It's, you know, those are the kinds of things for meditation put you immediately into an altered state. Nature is our best teacher. Let's look at her rhythms. There are really three basic ways phylo, leaf, taxis arrangement occurs. If you have a 360 degree circle, uh, 180 degrees back and forth like with corn, distitious like here, you go here, then you go here, 90 degrees here, and so forth, but then you get the spiral. Now these are going to be reversed on this screen, but notice what happens. You got the three types of arrangement, distitious here, and here's the world, and then the third one, the majority, which we're going to see is very high. Here's the divergence angle, 137 and a half degrees. Now think about this. I showed you the yardstick, 36 inches, 13.75 inches. The winding number of nature turns out to be 137 and a half degrees. That's the rotation angle. 80% of the 250,000 known species is a whole heck of a lot more than that. This from Michael Schneider's uh, uh, website drawings is the phylotaxis leaf arrangement. Professor David Bohm, one of my teachers, expresses the key this way. The essential features of quantum interconnectedness are that the whole universe is in some way enfolded in everything and that each thing is enfolded back into the whole. And this is probably one of the ways of looking at it is the biomathematics. So we get the phi spirals. They're generally Fibonacci's. We can't talk about Lucas now. We just don't have time. We even know that it's not only out there in nature, but it's also the way we look, perceive things uh, through visual perception, uses the golden section. Then you start to look. The majority of wildflowers, they're pentagonal. Most flowers are going to be Fibonacci numbers. Yes, lilies are six petals, but take a close look. They're three and three. They're root three. But just all you got to do is look at nature and you'll see it. I admonish you to look at the center always. There's a key in the center, generally speaking. And because we need to move for time, some things are obvious. Last time my book was done properly, 500 years ago, Luca Pacioli, the monk drunk on beauty, did Divina Proportione. And notice what you got down here. And there's his assistant. And guess who the illustrator was? This is the real Da Vinci Code. This is where the Renaissance is coming from, the rediscovery of the mathematics of the Egyptians, ancient Greeks, Babylonians, etc., and then putting it out there in the design. You go to Florence, and it puts you in an altered state, just going into the uh, places. Here, uh, my friend Aaron and I on, my, on the stage at my college are building these big uh, dodecahedrons and then connecting them up. Uh, some of the artists, like Dali, they figure out how to take the canvas. I'm sorry the top got cut off in this. His, his canvas is five by three. They realize that if you want to draw the attention of the individuals in, you put it in golden relationship. And of course, there's the dodecahedron. Now we're beginning to, to recognize that the universe may in fact be dodecahedral. Exactly what Plato said. You know how they're figuring it out? This is really interesting. It's being inferred, abducted or retroducted from anomalous findings from the harmonics, these these bizarre findings of what they call the second and third harmonics of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Leonardo da Vinci again, buckyball, truncated icosahedron. Look at this Malaysian fern. And it's all, it's, it's just one. So you link together the hexagon, the pentagon, and pentagram and hexagram. Fullerene, carbon 60, led to a Nobel Prize. There it is. And notice the names here. This guy is a biggie, Karuga Stuart Hameroth. Carbon 60, science news, fullerene drugs. How do they get into the HIV virus? They put them in these cages. Now, for me, I go into isolation in the rainforest in Peru just before I wrote my golden section book. And I was taken out of my body. I was shown how the golden ratio actually works. 
I was awake for 19 days straight, never went to sleep once after that. It drove my wife batty, uh, or up the wall, I should say. She wouldn't appreciate that. But uh, I'm serious. Uh, most people don't believe me, but it's absolutely true. In six, seven months after that, I wrote the golden section. I would take the plants and I would number the pieces. I'd take them apart. I'd study them outwardly. I'd go inwardly into inner states of meditation and work together and join the outside and the inside. Uh, this is, these are Weichel Indians after they come out of their inner experiences. See the spiral, the serpent, see at the end. Now, the big cat, big time. Narashima, Dionysus, big cats, always, when one goes into these deep states of consciousness. Now, I'm only showing you this. Yeah, I got pretty good, yes. <laughs> but I want you to notice the face, because the shamans in Peru know what happens to me when I'm working on the golden section, and so they have superimposed my face with the big cat. This is Maya, one of my cats. My wife and I have three cats. You don't get to see uh, Nandi, little boy, and Shiva, big boy, uh, but this cat thinks it's a big cat. But I really learn from my dogs, Thor and Odin. <laughs> Dr. Baker says this is not a dog, this is already <laughs> entering into the human kingdom. Used to go when Dr. Baker would stay at her house, he'd go in and he'd, he'd learn from the cat how to open doors, any door he can open. And he'd go in and steal his socks. This is the golden section book in the chapters that uh, John Martineau and I he came to the US. We laid it out. We figured out what we're going to do. And these are the chapters. We just laid it out on the floor what I was going to do. Here's Bucky Fuller. Notice what he's surrounded with. Uh, here's uh, Keith Critchlow, I mentioned before, Sacred Geometry, John Michelle, wonderful man. Before John passed, he did that painting for me, and I'll read it for you, New Light on Fine. A book I greatly value, it's the pride of my collection, is Mr. Olson's recent work upon the Golden Section. It is something that could change the world. If they could understand it, I'm certain the authorities would long ago have banned it. The secret it exposes is the key to life's creation. I can't explain it in a line, so here's an illustration. Here's what happens. This is Keith's grandson. Here's what happens when you nest the solids. It puts you in synchrony, and that's the beauty of Platonic and Archimedean solids. This is Alex Gray. This is um, Lance Harding, Canon of Human Proportion, Dan Duddy, and over here is Zachariah and uh, who did some illustrations for my book. This is part of the internal structure of the cosmos itself. My favorite cathedral is Wells Cathedral, and you obviously they figured out how to design the principles, cardinal alignments in the golden section, leaf Solquist, nucleotide frequencies in the human genome and Fibonacci numbers. That was 2008. This was just published recently, Codex Biogenesis. Unfortunately, it's only in uh, French. Someone uh, wrote over with Ruth Mills. Uh, she's studying some of Kalaman's work. He did an introduction for it. Look what's going on. Human genome binary code. Yeah, with computers, we invented it. But binary code of life, that's different. Uh, it's either by self-organization spontaneously or theosophy perhaps by divine action, but it is not an accident. It is not a hazard. And meanwhile, the ratio between both bistable states is equal to two. Why? Because the top level is phi, I'm sorry, little baby phi, one over phi, and the bottom level is half of that, half of phi, and so they're in ratio of two, where big phi is the golden ratio. It's all resonance. I'm not going to take the time to read this because we are getting very close to when I really need to close. I just wanted to show you, this is all in my book. Here's the DNA, microtubules and clathrins. You see the ratios of the DNA. This is important. Buddha said the body's an eye. In the state of phi-induced quantum coherence, one may experience samadhi. Cosmic conscious identification with the awareness of the universe itself. One experiences all knowledge, omniscience, omnipotence, all power, omnipresence, spread throughout the whole deal. Light and ecstasy. And um, here we have 
the middle way of Buddha, um, which was recognized by Victor Schoenberg in his works on water, is it's an asymmetric cut. It's the golden cut. That's the middle path. And here's my golden ratio. More recently, I helped Alexei Stackov do the mathematics of harmony. Uh, this is caught on now, and at um, Odessa University in October, we go there to speak, and we got a list of 20 people. It's all golden ratio. The university is adopting it across the curriculum. This is the future of education. Very quickly, I'll go through this. Egypt. Badawi figured out that over 50 temples have Fibonacci numbers. Harem outside, the casing stones on the Great Pyramid are still there. You can figure them out. Look at the angle here. That apothem, that slant, is where the big phi, the golden ratio, occurs. But I'll show you in a second. Here I'm measuring it. My wife always tells me, you're staring at the woman there. You're not looking at the, but it's not true. I'm figuring, OK, can I get in there? And I think back, well, yeah, I should be able to come out of the body. So I jump in. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm on top of the bugger, looking down 50 start. No, I'm teasing, because I actually had to climb it with all my camera equipment. Wasn't easy, but that's what it looks like on top. And the primordial scission is the golden scission, golden cut. Here's that tr triangle that is the secret key to the Great Pyramid, and Elsie Christie Kieland, Geometry in Egyptian Art, you'll see that the measurements suggest golden section. Nobody's really figured this out until Robert Temple took, took a peek at it. This is at 26 and a half degrees. It's down by the Valley Temple by the Sphinx. And it's the same thing inside the pyramid, the ascending passageway and descending pass passageway. They're both how you, they're root five, they're how you get to the golden section. These guys figured out how to take, this is the south, this is an old picture. It was cloudy when Temple tried to get his picture on the summer solstice. The Khafra's pyramid casts a shadow on Khufu's pyramid, the Great Pyramid, on the summer solstice that is 26 and a half degrees. It's incredible what these geniuses did. Schwaller de Lubitsch, Temple of Man. The golden section is not a product of imagination. It is the natural principle of the laws of equilibrium. It is the principle of equilibrium itself. Well, thank you very much.